All right. Happy Monday. It is July 6th. I hope everybody had a happy 4th of July Independence Day. Hope you have all your fingers and toes and everything else. And I hope you stayed safe and socially distanced. Uh, I am currently recording to you from about an hour from Chicago. I had to go see family and all that, so I'm recording off of a laptop today. So it may not be as good as normal, but I hope it is. All right, our topic for today is the antebellum South, and this is just pre-Civil War South, what's going on. And let's see. All right, we have to talk about the growth of the South and what's happening there. And uh, between 1800 and 1860, people are slowly moving further and further west. Uh, they start along the coast by the early 1800s. They're as far inland as basically Athens, Augusta, Milledgeville, that area. By the time we get into the 1830s, people have expanded all the way into both Alabama and Mississippi. And then by the time you get into the 1840s, there are people in Louisiana and Texas that are of American descent. Most of these people are going to be pioneers, uh, herdsmen, meaning that they have herds of animals. Uh, they're going to be yeoman farmers, which means independent farmers. And most of them are going to move just because there's so much population along the coast that there's nowhere for them to live anymore. Uh, the population growth in the eastern states, it cuts down the amount of grazing land and farmland, so they have to go and find new land. And some of these Settlers are going to be lucky enough to get uh, really good agricultural areas, but a lot of them are going to settle into woods that aren't very good for slavery or cotton farming. Uh, think of like North Georgia where there's a lot of woods, or Northern Alabama where there's a lot of woods. Now in 1793, Eli Whitney, same one who did Interchangeable Parts, is going to invent the cotton gin. And Eli Whitney is going to make it easier for cotton to be grown. Uh, if you don't know what a cotton gin is, it's basically this machine that will stretch the cotton fibers and the seeds will fall out. Now why is that important? It allows this change from what's called long staple cotton to short staple cotton. Uh, with long staple cotton, more of the seeds bloom or blossom, if you will, and it's easier to get the seeds out of long staple cotton, but as it says in the name, it takes a long time for it to grow. Short staple cotton, uh, it has a shorter growth time, a shorter gestation period, if you will, but it also has a lot more seeds and the seeds are sticky. So the cotton gin is going to make it easier to remove the seeds from the cotton, which allows the places cotton can be grown to grow. So before you know it, cotton is going to spread throughout the southeast. Now, what were the reasons for this spreading? Well, there are really three of them that you can look at. Um, the English cotton mills are going to want cotton from the south. In fact, England gets like 70% of all the cotton that's grown in the southern United States. On um, that, have the northern textile mills, like the, the workers of Lowell, Massachusetts, they're going to want a lot of the cotton too. And then right around the same time Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin, the, the value of tobacco is going to crash, and tobacco is not going to be nearly as profitable as it used to be. Now, as cotton spreads, slavery is going to spread as well. Um, you can see between 1820 and 1860, there are over 2 million African Americans who are either forcibly moved by their owners or sold to other people in the Gulf States region. So over 2 million African Americans are moved against their will into places like Louisiana, South Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama. Now what were uh, social relations like amongst uh, the white southerners? Well you kind of have this hierarchy. You have planters at the top. Now who was a planter? They were the ones with money so to speak. Uh, they typically own 20 or more slaves, and they only make up about 5% of the population. It's not like you see in, in Gone with the Wind or something like that. A lot of these planters are actually in debt because they're always buying and selling land trying to get more or better returns. 
the plantation owner was gone a lot of the times, and the, the woman of the plantation, the so-called plantation mistress, is the one who ran a lot of the day-to-day uh, business transactions. Uh, she would be the one who was in charge of the children, in charge of making sure that everything in the house runs correctly, and she would be like the husband's deputy, if you will. Underneath that is the small slaveholder. They have less than 20 slaves, and they make up somewhere around 15 to 20 percent of the population. Um, they are going to almost be like the swing vote. In areas where the small slaveholders are live close and interact closely with planters, they're usually going to be more planter-like. Uh, if they are going to live more closer to the independent farmers or the yeoman farmers, they're going to live more like that. So small slaveholders are really kind of the swing in between these two. Uh, then yeoman farmers, they are independent farmers. They own no slaves. Uh, they usually own their own farms, and their farms are somewhere between 50 and 200 acres. So they're not necessarily small. They're just worked by the people that own them. And 60% of the population is going to be most of them. <clears throat> Typically, these yeoman farmers are going to be away from a plantation belt. They're going to be further north in the wooded areas, things like that. And then at the bottom, you have poor whites, make up about 10% of the population. Uh, they don't own land. They don't own slaves. They're either going to be squatters, meaning they're living illegally on somebody's land, or they're going to be laborers working for other people. Now, the planters are going to control the slavery. Planters are going to control the society. Planters are the ones in control. Uh, they're the smallest population percentage. You saw a minute ago, 5%. Um, the reason why is because everybody wants to be a planter. Everybody looks up to the planters. The small slaveholders, they want to be planters. The yeoman farmers get help from the planters. Poor whites, they work for the planters. So you can see how everything goes uphill, so to speak, to the planters. Now, all of the white groups, they want to keep control over African Americans. From the top to the bottom of white society, they saw African Americans as an inferior race of people. And the idea of having slaves meant that all whites were equal, so to speak. There were even some really, really crazy pro-slavery arguments out there. There were people that said slavery was good. There were people that said slavery is in religion. Slavery is in history. There were some arguments, which you have to read one of these. It says slaves were treated better than workers in the North because everything was given to the slaves. And in Southern churches, they, Southern church preachers actually spoke in support of slavery all the way up to the Civil War. <clears throat> Now, what was it like if you were a slave? Well, it's really hard to summarize what life was like as a slave in the South because there were so many different variables. It depended on who the owner was, how the owner treated the slave, what type of work the slave did, if they were in the countryside, if they were in the city, if they were near other slaves, if they lived in the deep South, if they lived in the upper South, lots of different variables. So no one can actually summarize what it was like to be a slave. Because it's so complex and so complicated, um, everything I'm saying here is just kind of a generality. It's not how it was for everybody. So food is very basic. Uh, pork, cornmeal, coffee, molasses, corn syrup. If the slave is lucky, they can have their own vegetable garden. And in some very rare cases, the slaves were trusted enough to hunt and they were able to get additional meat to supplement their food. Uh, clothing, uh, usually one or two cotton shirts or one or two dresses per year. If your cotton shirt or your dress got a hole in it, you had to mend it yourself. Men would get uh, one or two pair of rough canvas pants. Think of like a burlap sack if you're at the Grocery store, touch one of those burlap sacks next time and just imagine having to wear it. Um, straw hats were given for field work and no shoes until it got cold. Housing, uh, it's typically going to be a one room cabin. That's 10 feet by 20 feet. That is about the average size of a master bedroom today. It's going to be a wooden door. 
There's going to be one or two windows. They don't have any glass in them. They have these wooden shutters that you shut when it gets cold, and of course, plenty of wind gets in there still. Uh, the floor is going to be dirt. There's going to be mud spackled into the walls to try and keep out the wind and try to keep out the cold. And there's going to be a crude fireplace. There's going to be a crude chimney, just enough to keep you warm. The furniture is handmade, usually straw bedding. So these people are living on straw beds on the ground, much like an animal would. And two families are going to share that one room cabin. So look at your bedroom and imagine your bedroom having two families in it. And that's going to be pretty close to what they were dealing with. Because people were so close together, disease is everywhere. Uh, the poor diets mean that the immune systems are weak, no shoes, uh, crowded housing means if somebody does get sick, it spreads like wildfire. And usually the infections are severe because there's no, no doctoring, there's no medicine for these people. Work patterns. Before I do work patterns, your word of the day. Your secret word, is rebel, R-E-B-E-L, in honor of the 4th of July and the fact that the colonists were rebels. Your word of the day is rebel, R-E-B-E-L. Rebel, R-E-B-E-L, is your secret word for today. All right, moving on to these work patterns. Uh, there's two different things that were used, uh, gang labor and task labor. Gang labor is what you find in cotton fields and tobacco fields. It's what people think of traditionally when you're thinking of slavery. That's where everybody works together in the field. Men and women are both working in the field, but they're doing different jobs. And you're going to find that a lot in the Deep South. Task labor is going to be a little differently. Task labor is going to be mostly like rice plantations and things like that everybody has a different job men and women work separately and um, they're not quite as dependent on each other gang labor everybody works together task labor everybody works separately and they have individual jobs so that's important dis distinction between the two so gang labor is cotton fields task labor rice fields gang labor tobacco fields task labor is in sugar plantations. They're going to work really long hours. Sun up to sundown. You might get a small break in the middle of the day, but it's not going to be very long. Uh, depending on the season will depend on what type of work you're doing and how long you're working. Spring and summer, you can probably guess this, it's the longest and the hardest hours to work. Uh, that's when the planting is done that's when the harvesting is done and then fall after the harvest and winter are spent preparing for the next season so there's no off season if you will there's no downtime it's just whatever work they're doing is going to be a little bit different there are some slaves who work as house servants there are some slaves that work as artisans meaning that they're making stuff so you can get maids personal servants blacksmiths carpenters uh, these slaves are going to do pretty much any job you can imagine. Um, the working conditions are both good and bad, comparatively speaking. The good, they're not having to do the field work. But the bad is they're working closer to the owners. Their behavior is always looked at. And there is this additional hazard of these unwanted sexual advances. <clears throat> these servants are generally better off than field workers but that's not always the case there are also slaves that are working in cities and in industries uh, it's like tinsmith coppersmith silversmith carpentry some slaves are even going to build ships uh, there's greater freedom of movement slaves who live in the cities can move pretty much anywhere some slaves can work in factories some in mines and some in lumber yards and skilled slaves are going to have the highest value. Uh, I don't understand how you put a value on a person like this, but there's evidence of a silversmith being sold in Charleston for $25,000. Today that is almost a million dollars if I remember correctly. 
Now, this, the idea of controlling these slaves. Uh, the physical condition is very comparable to an independent farmer or a poor white. The physical condition isn't that much different than a poor white person. But the control is much worse. Slaves are subject to being whipped, being caged, being branded, being denied food. And there's a really important court case. It was the state of North Carolina versus Mann. And this was a North Carolina Supreme Court case from 1830. And the ruling from this court case said that slave owners had absolute authority over their slaves and could not be found guilty of committing violence against them. It is that court case in 1830 that definitively said slaves are property, they're not people. And you see there the quote from North Carolina Chief Justice Thomas Ruffin. He said, the power of the master must be absolute to render the submission of the slave perfect. So the slave owners can do anything they wanted to to get the slave to comply, and it was not illegal. And that is what made slavery the absolute worst. Just the fact that there was nobody watching over them. There was no protections for these people. They were treated inhumanely and, quite frankly, like animals. As bad as that was, it's the mental aspect that is the absolute worst. There's complete control of everything the slave does. There's complete control of movement. There are slave patrols that search for running away or missing slaves. You have no free will. You must submit to every demand. And there is complete uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen in your future. You don't know about your family. You don't know about your safety. Now, there were some masters who were, quote, good because they treated their slaves as valuable property. And there were slaves who were bad, or slave masters who were bad, because they treated their slaves as replaceable property. But no matter whether they were good or bad, notice the word property is in there with both descriptions. Now, there was resistance and there was rebellion. There were forms of individual resistance. Uh, so there was work slowdowns, there was purposeful sabotage, there was running away, and people who ran away, sometimes it was just temporary. They would often come back after a couple hours. But there were some who ran away and it was permanent. Uh, there was theft, there was arson, there was murder, all those are forms of individual resistance. And there are three relatively well-known rebellions, and I think you should know about these three rebellions. On August 30th, 1800, there was Gabriel Prosser and his rebellion. Uh, his plan was, he was a blacksmith, first of all. He had some freedom because he was a blacksmith. He and his brother planned to lead slaves into Richmond, Virginia, and burn down Richmond. It's estimated that he had direct support of probably 50 to 60 slaves. Probably another 1,000 knew about it. When the plan was discovered, all the leaders were executed, including Gabriel and his brother. Denmark Vesey, uh, he was a free black man who lived in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, in the spring of 1822, he won his freedom in a lottery, and he conspired to lead a rebellion. Maybe as many as 3,000 slaves knew about this. And when the rebellion started, uh, all the leaders of the rebellion were, were arrested and executed. And that one was put down pretty harshly as well. And then the most famous of the rebellions is Nat Turner's. And you've done some reading on him already. August 21st through August 23rd of 1831. Uh, Turner was educated. He became a preacher. And he had a lot of freedom because he was a preacher. He planned for a long time on how to revolt. He, saw, he thought he had a sign from God and that he was supposed to lead a revolt. And he led a group of about 100 slaves in rebellion. Uh, they kill 60 whites before the rebellion ends. Um, when the rebellion is put down, 200 black individuals are executed, including some who didn't even know anything about the rebellion. And it's actually Nat Turner's Rebellion, which is the one people think about when they're talking about rebellions in the South. So those are three pretty important and famous rebellions that happened. All right, let me see here. 
here's our course schedule and this is what's left for the semester you'll see we are currently on this week right here uh, lesson 11 12 and 13 in the the lessons folders for this week you've got form 11 form 12 form 13 you've got chapter quiz 11 12 13 you're also of course going to have your secret word quiz which hopefully by now you realize those aren't hard that's a very easy a for you if you watch these videos next week is our last week of actual instruction we're three weeks away from the final exam it's hard to believe because summer goes so fast so next week you're going to have your fourth reflection paper due and you're going to have your research paper due so you have two weeks from this video to do your research paper and i'm going to put up a bonus video here uh, in just a little while and it'll tell you how you do your reflection paper or your research paper and what i'm looking for and then don't forget that museum review is due on the very last day of class on july 26th for your museum review you can use one of those virtual museums or you can watch one of those movies so either one is fine um, but just take note we're really close to the end now so you know keep on pushing and we'll get through this last month and hopefully you guys are going to get great grades all right that's it for now from uh, northern illinois we'll see you soon and i'll be back home hopefully for thursday for wednesday's video bye bye